uh, yeah, this week we are going to talk about DSP, digital signal processors. Um, I think there's a lot to talk about with DSP. Obviously, Audio Control's been doing uh, digital signal processing for a long time in one way or another. Uh, I think that's one of the things that a lot of guys forget sometimes, too, is that not every DSP has to be, um, you know, the, the DSP in the traditional sense. And we're going to cover a couple of those things today and kind of go over, you know, what that means. So just to kind of start out a little bit, let's just start with the basics. You know, what is a DSP? DSP is a digital signal processor. That can mean a lot of things, okay? But in, in our opinion and what we mean by that is basically any of these boxes that can be installed in your car audio system and process that signal, manipulate that signal, and make it sound better. Now, there's a lot of things that at that point you could then call a DSP. I mean, you could honestly, you could call an epicenter a DSP because it is processing signal. But today, what we're going to talk about is DSPs in the more traditional sense. And that is something that's going to um, really manipulate the whole system and, and provide a lot more control than your traditional, you know, head unit or something like that. So some of the most common questions that we get with DSP, and I think that a lot of the shops have to address and a lot of the installers and sales guys have to address is, well, can I just do all that with my aftermarket head unit? You know, I just bought this fill in the blank, Pioneer, Kenwood, Alpine, JVC, whatever um, head unit, and it's got this great EQ and it's got time correction and it's got crossovers and it's got all these things. Why don't I just use that? Well, part of the reason that we say not to just use that there's, there's lots of reasons, but the biggest thing is just the adjustability, how much you can manipulate that signal and the quality of it as well. You know, are the crossovers that are built into that head unit at the slope that you want them to be? Are they um, a good quality crossover? Is there a lot of, you know, uh, bleed over? Is there, you know, what is it that's built into that head unit? And so that's one of the biggest things is I think a lot of guys look at this new double din that they bought or even high end single din for that matter. And they say, well, you know, I've got crossovers, I've got an EQ, I've got time correction, I've got, um, you know, maybe even some uh, sound effect stuff, you know, hall, uh, classic rock, pop, whatever presets. And so they go, well, you know, I kind of have that stuff. But you have to remember that these DSPs that we're talking about are going to do a lot more than just those basics. And we're going to get into more of that here in a little bit. But I think that's one of the biggest things, you guys, is that no, you really can't do everything that a high quality DSP can do in a aftermarket head unit. Because one of the other things that we can do with a DSP, any of the DSPs that are on the table here that we're gonna talk about, is all of these are going to also act as basically a line driver in one way or another. And so regardless of how high quality that, that radio is that you or your customer purchased, um, you know, it doesn't matter. You're never going to get more voltage out of that head unit than you are out of one of these DSPs. And we'll talk about the specific voltages and stuff here in a little bit. So the next basic thing that I wanna cover is, well, I don't wanna use a, a computer or an app. I'm not comfortable with that. My shop doesn't have a computer. The boss won't buy me one. I don't wanna go buy one, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, there's arguments for both sides of that. I think any decent shop should have a, a, a laptop in the shop. I think today, in, in today's world with car audio, it's a necessity. I think it's a tool just like a drill or a nice set of crimpers are, but we won't get into that argument today. If you are a shop that doesn't have a computer or your technicians, maybe you're a sales guy and your technicians are just not comfortable with the computer, they don't like it, they don't want to, whatever the reason may be, the answer to the question on your screen right now is, yes, you can still use a DSP even without a computer, a tablet, a smartphone, whatever. And that would be one of the arguments I would always say to the guys that don't want to use a computer or they say, hey, my shop doesn't have a computer, is you, know, you can set up and tune the products that do require a computer, you can set them up and tune them from a smartphone. Pretty much everybody on the planet these days has a smartphone. So there's really no excuse if that's your excuse. Um, but if you just flat out say, you know what, I wanna keep things simple. I don't wanna use a computer. I don't wanna use software. We do have some options that don't require um, software and we'll dig into more of that here in a little bit. So one of the other things is, so do I really need a DSP in my system? I think the answer to this is yes, not just because I work for audio control and I know how good these can sound, but because when I get asked, and I get asked this a lot, what's the one thing I should add to my system? It already sounds okay, but do I really need one? You know, 
Um, and I think to me, the answer is yes. And not just because it's going to make the system sound better, but what's the thing that, you know, a lot of car audio guys do over time is upgrade, right? We're always chasing that perfect sound or, you know, we're always chasing that higher volume or that better clarity or better staging, you know, whatever it is that you're chasing, you know, we're always happy with them for a while and we always want it to be better and bigger and louder and cleaner and, you know, whatever, right? We're always upgrading. So there's nothing better in a system to allow for upgrades and expansion and kind of future proof yourself a little bit than a DSP. You know, it's going to allow complete control over that system, channel assignments, like I said earlier, equalization, crossing over, um, time correction, signal summing, you know, everything that you sure might be able to do some of that stuff in a very limited fashion in another product, maybe in the head unit or in a, um, you know, a, a more basic product, like say an LC6i, LC7i, something like that. Will an LC7i do signal summing? Sure it will. Will it do it the same as one of these products will? No, it's not the same. You know, so that's one of those things where, um, to me, yes, you really do need a DSP in your system. And I think there's a lot of shops that are adopting this at this point. You talk to a lot of guys out there that are doing really well in the 12 volt world right now, and they are basing every single system, you know, on a DSP of some sort, whether it's an entry level, you know, fairly low cost DSP or a super high end full featured DSP, every system they design for their customers is based around one. And part of the reason for that is that they can always come back later. And when they want to add that extra amplifier or they want to add, you know, whatever it is, maybe they started out with just a, a 2.1 system to begin with, but you sold them an uh, eight output DSP or a 10 output DSP. Well, great. Now when they come back and they have the money to upgrade the rears and add another amplifier to do it, they've already got the, the DSP set up. All they have to do is, you know, add it physically, add it to the car, and you're already prepped for it. The other thing to think about with this is that the DSP today is really, if, if you want to think of it the way that I am, um, it's really today's head unit, okay? You know, there are still a lot of cars out there, of course, that we can put aftermarket radios in, but as an industry, we need to shift our thinking a little bit into, into thinking more about these are today's head units, okay? Because as time moves on, we've all seen it, more and more cars cannot accept a new head unit. Or even if they could, you wouldn't want to. You know, I'm glancing out at the parking lot here right now. The first four cars that are parked out here are all vehicles that you either cannot or would not want to change the head unit in. So it just goes to prove that point that really these are today's head units. And what are you really going to gain by adding a DSP? My system already sounds pretty good, a lot of people say. And that could be, you know, somebody with a factory head unit or an aftermarket head unit. And they say, you know, it already sounds really good. I'm pretty happy. You may be, but until you've heard it to its full potential with, say, a DSP in place, you really don't know what you're missing. And so really, what are they going to gain by adding a DSP to an existing aftermarket system? Well, it kind of depends on what's there. If they already have an aftermarket head unit in there and they've got amplifiers and, you know, say they've got a five channel amp, uh, aftermarket head unit, all new speakers and a sub. That's a pretty traditional everyday aftermarket system, right? What are they going to gain by adding a DSP? Well, they're going to gain a lot, right? Because we're going to add uh, or up their signal voltage significantly by going into one of these DSP products. So we're going to gain clarity. We're going to gain volume. We're going to lessen distortion. We're also just going to give a whole lot more control. And then depending on what they have, as far as that aftermarket head unit's concerned, we may be adding time correction or, or time delay that they didn't already have. Um, and depending on which product we're talking about, we'll get into that in a little bit. That is really, really easy to do on all of these DSP products. So really, it makes a huge difference. I used to demo a DSP in my own car when I worked at a shop. And I used a DQDX in my car. I had a 2.1 setup. It was just uh, active components in the front, or excuse me, passive components in the front and a woofer. And I would use the DQDX to switch the time correction on and off. And it makes for just a fantastic demo. And it's one of those things where if you're a shop and you don't currently have a demo car or you're not taking customers out to your one of your personal vehicles or your shop vehicle, whatever, um, it's really something you should invest a little bit of time in. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. It just needs to be something that makes them say, wow, that sounds really good. So we'll dig more into the actual products themselves here in just a second. Yeah, so, some, some, oh, yeah, some other ahead. things that I would just add on to that. I mean, a lot of us have been installing and doing this a long time. Yeah. Um, one of the things, you know, 
for probably 15 years, I know of one shop at, down in California that, you know, if they were even selling a pair of uh, $199 or more um, component speakers, that it was kind of mandated that they use a DSP. And I've kind of always liked that logic. I'm slightly different in that, you know, I feel like uh, the first real upgrade in adding into a lot of OE cars and stuff like that is always aftermarket amplification, you know, mm -hmm. not changing out speakers or anything like that. But man, that would, that would definitely be, you know, the second thing is DSP 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've even had guys ask, you know, sometimes calling into audio control and just asking us, um, you know, hey, I have a factory system that I'm actually pretty happy with. Could I add, you know, just a DSP to my factory system? And, you know, could you do it? Yeah, you probably could. I think it would be a little bit more work than it's probably really worth. Um, but there are some systems today that actually, you know, from the factory sound pretty decent, but what they need is some tuning, right? They need some DSP in there. And that's, that's, you know, where the power of DSP stuff really comes in is that adjustability. That's a prime example of where the car already sounds pretty good, but what's it missing? That's what it's missing, right? It's usually missing bass and it's missing some tunability or adjustability, some sort of EQ. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that it could be missing. So with the DSP lineup uh, on your screen right now, you can see kind of the, the DSP family of products from Audio Control. There's two pieces on here that a lot of guys I don't think normally think of as a DSP. I'm including them today because I actually really like them. I think they're powerful products and I think they are overlooked by a lot of shops. Um, when people think of DSP, what they traditionally think of is something like our DM608. Okay, so DM608, six channels of input, eight channels of output. This is your, you know, what you'd probably think of as a traditional DSP. And in that, you know, sense of the word and, and what people are thinking of when they think of DSP, yes, the DM608 and DM810 are going to be your more traditional full featured DSPs. The DQ61 and DQDX are a little bit more specific, but they still um, definitely have their place uh, in, in the car audio world. And we're going to dive into each product uh, individually here in just a second. But I just want to give you kind of an overview of what we're looking at today, and it's these four products. So two of these are uh, full featured um, digital DSPs. Two of these are DSPs that use analog controls, which I think appeals to a lot of technicians out there that maybe aren't as familiar or aren't as comfortable um, with some of the software or applications and things like that. Um, there was a question on here asking if this training will still be recorded for Facebook. It will be recorded and I will post it to Facebook as soon as we're done today. So it will still go up on Facebook. Um, we'll get it there and we'll also get it to uh, YouTube later as well. So moving on to the actual products themselves, we'll start with the DQDX. Uh, this is the first one we're going to talk about. The DQDX is a pretty cool piece. It's in a nice metal casing, just like all of these audio control products are. Um, that's something that, you know, a lot of guys probably don't think about, but literally everything we do is in these nice um, metal casings. None of it's plastic. It's really, really well built. You pick these up, you take them out of the box. They feel like quality because they are. So the DQDX is a cool piece. This is a six channel input, six channel output DSP. So this is low level in, low level out. So this is obviously going to usually be used for your um, aftermarket head unit applications. Um, but there's some cool things that you can do with this. This is one of those pieces where this is great for the guy that already has an aftermarket system. If you or a customer of yours comes into the shop, you know, hey, I've already got this radio and these speakers and amps and all this stuff's already installed. That sounds pretty good, but I think I'm just kind of missing that little bit of something. Um, this is sprinkle this in, sprinkle a little bit of DQDX magic into that system, and suddenly it really comes to life. I've seen it with my own system. I had a nice aftermarket head unit, nice amplifier, nice fronts and sub, but it was just missing a little bit of something, and adding this piece in made all the difference in the world. So this is one of those that I always suggest to guys too, if they need something quick to drop into their existing system uh, to make it a demo, or uh, their shop vehicle, something like that, the DQDX is a great piece to do that. So besides just being six channels in, six channels out, the DQDX has some really cool features. So up at the top here, we have our equalization. So we have seven bands of equalization for front, seven for rear, and seven for sub. We also have our crossover frequency on here. The crossover frequency is for the channel three output, so for your subwoofer only. 
okay? And then up above that is signal delay, and we'll get into that in just a second. But one of the really cool things here too is down at the bottom, we have independent input and output levels for each pair of channels. So you can really kind of mix this however you like. Um, you can adjust exactly how much signal is coming in from each one of those channels. So, you know, maybe it's not an aftermarket head unit. Maybe it's a car where you're using some sort of an integration module uh, that gives you RCA outputs, right? Maybe you're using a PATH AMP Pro or the Metra Access uh, module or a Zen module or, you know, one of those guys. This would be a great piece to go in between that system and the amplifiers. I think that's one of those things that a lot of guys miss a little bit when they're doing some of these newer vehicles where, you know, does a PAC Amp Pro make all the difference in the world? Absolutely. You know, that works super, super well in these newer vehicles that are factory amplified and kind of tricky to integrate with. But going straight from a PAC Amp Pro straight into your amplifiers, sure, it'll work, but you have very little adjustability, right? You have almost nothing there as far as control other than what's in the factory head unit what's on the factory, or excuse me, what's on your aftermarket amplifiers. So unless you're running a DSP-based amplifier, you really don't have a whole lot there to tune that system, right? So if you added in something like the DQDX, that's where this would really come into play, is now we've got seven bands of EQ per set of channels. That works really well for adjustability there. And then we have all of our input and output. But this is also gonna give us seven and a half volts of RCA low-level output. So we're gonna get a nice, hot, clean signal coming out of this. We're gonna you know, increase uh, headroom, decrease the distortion, just give us more volume, more clarity, just send a really nice hot clean signal to those amplifiers and keep the gain down on those amplifiers so they're gonna obviously run cooler, last longer, and have less distortion. So uh, all good things. One of the other cool things that's in the DQDX is a um, signal delay module, okay? So the signal delay is really cool. This allows us to basically do a form of time alignment or time delay, however you want to call it, time correction. It's basically all words for the same thing, um, but it does it with analog controls. I've explained how this works in videos in the past, so some of you may have heard me go over this in the past, but I'll give you a brief explanation of it here anyway. So the way that this works is pretty slick. This is going to come with one of our ACR uh, dash control knobs, okay? So you're gonna need to use the dash control knob for setting this product up. So what I'm gonna do is I'll actually plug power into this guy real quick, just so you can kind of see it uh, work a little bit. So let's- Well, well while you're doing that, Matthew, there's a good question here from Sean. Sure. Um, is there any reason for having specifically 2K and 8K adjustability on the highs? In other words, are those problem frequencies or is it just random available frequencies? And you know, this product is, has been around for a while, a long time, probably longer than I've been at audio control. Well, I know it has been, but if you logic it out and look at the frequencies that are available in the EQ, uh, it, it has to do with octaves. So if you, if you go up every two channels uh, or two settings, you're basically uh, one octave up, uh, two octave up, eight octave up. So it just is a multiplier as you go through and go up in, in, in octaves on the, on the EQ there. Perfect. So, so. Do those because there is anything specifically about it, I would assume, and I'm just, I'm just logically this out from the question, but um, sure. I think it just has to do with the, the frequency and, and just going up uh, numerically in octaves. Yep. Makes sense. So on the signal delay mode here, um, we have this little, knob up there at the top. You can see it on your screen right up here towards the top of the DQDX. It says signal delay mode. So under normal circumstances when this is installed, you've got a little blue LED that's lit up right here and it says normal, okay? When you are ready to set this up and you're ready to do your time correction portion of this, um, you can take your handy little audio control guitar pick and we want to turn signal delay over to setup. And when we switch it over to setup, the little LED next to setup, which is orange, lights up, okay? Now on our dash control knob, you're gonna use this to actually do the setup. And how that works is you're gonna wanna play a song that's heavy in vocals and light in instruments. So something that is, um, you know, maybe a, a, a real strong female vocalist or something like that. Uh, pick your favorite uh, Nora Jones track or whatever you're into, okay? Pick that out play something like that where there's not a lot of noise in the song, there's not a lot of 
loud guitar or anything like that. And the reason we suggest that is it's gonna make it easier to localize her voice, okay? So start playing that song. You're gonna take the uh, ACR3 dash control knob that comes with the product. And what you're gonna do is you're actually gonna turn the knob that's on here. And as you slowly turn this knob, you're gonna actually hear the sound come from the left door or the left speaker, wherever that may be. And then with every click of the knob, you're gonna actually hear her voice move a couple inches. Once she's to the center of the sound stage, you wanna click straight in on the ACR knob. And now you're adjusting the subwoofer, okay? So now you wanna play a song that is heavy and bass, something that you're familiar with, something that you know what it should sound like. And you wanna play this at moderate volume. It doesn't have to be super loud, but not quiet either. And now we wanna turn this knob again, and every time we slowly turn this knob, it's gonna move the woofer from the trunk or wherever it's located to more of an upfront centered bass. So when you're all done, it really should sound like she's singing to you from the middle of the dash or whoever the artist is from the middle of the dash, and the bass should be hard to localize. Your ears and brain should not be able to detect from the driver's seat that the subwoofer is in the trunk it should sound like the woofer is in the center console or just kind of all around you. That's the idea. So when you're done and you've got all your settings where you want them, all you've got to do is turn this piece back to normal. The little LED switches back to blue and you're done. Now your dash control knob becomes a subwoofer level control. And if you click straight in on the knob, it's going to disengage the time uh, signal delay or time delay, time correction, whatever you want to call it. And it's also going to disengage the EQ. So it's a really cool before and after. It's a great way to hear your changes take place and also hear that time correction. So when I mentioned earlier that it makes a great demo, it's the ultimate demo because it literally takes everything that's, uh, you know, all of your tuning from this takes it out temporarily. And with a click of the knob, it instantly comes back. You don't have to dive into menus and settings and all of these other things. So it's a pretty cool piece as far as being able to demo for customers and things like that. So let's move on to the next piece. One of the things I mentioned here too on your screen you'll see is that I have the no software needed down there. Like we just talked about, everything that you're going to do with the DQDX is all physically on the product. It's not something that you're going to have to dive into software for. So I pretty much just ran you through the setup. One other thing I will mention before we move on is there is a maximized input and output indicator on here. So if you don't have a uh, DMRTA, you don't have an oscilloscope at your shop, or you don't have a uh, DD1 or something like that, this is gonna help you to set up this product and get the maximum from your head unit, maximum input and output from the DQDX as best as we can without having all those tools. So especially if you're gonna, um, if you yourself are a, a do-it-yourselfer or you're uh, doing this at home, or if you have a customer you're gonna sell this to who's a DIY guy and wants to put this in himself, you can at least with these maximized input and output indicators know that he's got a, a real good chance of getting it set up correctly. So um, helpful little indicators that are built into that. So moving on to the next piece is the DQ61. The DQ61 is pretty slick. This is similar to the DQDX. You may notice it looks very much alike, except for a few big differences. So with the DQ61, this is high level input, capable of up to 40 volts of high level in, and then we have six channels of low level out. Again, we're gonna get seven and a half volts RMS uh, if we want it as our max output on this. So a really nice, hot, clean signal. And again, 40 volts of high level input. So that equates to about 400 watts, meaning there's really not a vehicle out there that you can't use this with, okay? Because just about anything out there is not gonna have 400 watts per channel in a factory sound system, or even an aftermarket system for that matter. That's one of those things where I think um, the DQ61 gets kind of uh, pigeonholed into being thought of as just an OEM integration device, but actually, you know, maybe your customer has a aftermarket head unit that just doesn't have enough RCA outputs. Maybe it only has one set and they're just really dead set on keeping that specific deck. Maybe they're an old school guy and it's an old school radio that they want to keep. But again, it only has one set of RCA outs or two sets of RCA outs, whatever it is. Um, you could use the speaker level outputs instead, feed those into this and still get six channels of um, low level output. Now both the DQ61 and the DQDX that we just talked about both also offer 
auto mode and signal summing. I should mention that before we get too much farther. So you can feed in just one or two channels of audio into this and we can still get all six channels of output. Um, now, one of the other things that you could use this for if you wanted to, is if you do have a vehicle that has factory three-way components in the front and each channel is independently crossed over and amplified, you could bring in uh, you know, high, mid, and low from the front of that vehicle, sum all of those channels together, and the main output on this is going to be that summed output. Uh, channel three will also still function as a low or subwoofer output as long as your low setup is uh, fed into the, or low signal is fed into the channel three input. So pretty cool stuff there. The ability to do summing um, and, and also do all of your signal mixing here. And what I mean by mixing is again, we have independent input levels for each set of inputs. We also have independent output levels for each set of outputs. So you've got uh, direct dials for those right there. We do have the maximized light on here as well. So that's gonna help with setup. And we have seven bands of EQ. So seven bands on the top for the front or main, seven bands for the rear or channel two. And then we have um, seven bands on the sub and we have Accubase. So the Accubase on this is pretty slick. Um, the Accubase is built in just like it would be on a LC7i or LC2i, but it's built into the sub portion of the DQ61. So one of the questions we get a lot on the DQ61 is, will that Accubase affect all output channels? The answer is no. It affects just channel three or the sub output, which is what you would expect. So it works just like you're thinking. But what we have on here is we have our level and our threshold built right on the front with two dials, and we have a Accubase indicator. So the little indicator is gonna show you when Accubase is uh, working or when it's engaged. So it's gonna help with setup a little bit and help you to dial in Accubase. If you have questions on how Accubase works, what that is, or how to set it up, we have all sorts of videos and, and training videos we've done in the past explaining exactly how to dial in uh, Accubase. So check out our Facebook or website if you wanna see some of those. So this also has the signal delay mode right above Accubase. You can see that right up towards the top there of the product. And this works exactly the same as your DQDX. One thing that's a little bit different, so it's still gonna come with the rotary controller for the front of the vehicle, right? We're still gonna set it all up from here. Uh, the setup is manual, just like I showed you on the other one. It's as simple as turning a knob. But one of the things that's a little bit different is under normal operating circumstances, when you are driving down the road or demoing this to a customer, or whatever the case may be, uh, maybe you wanna just show your significant other the cool new toy you installed, whatever. Um, when you click the knob on the DQ61, not only does it disengage your equalization, your time correction, but it also disengages the Accubase. So again, it's a really cool way to be able to show off that specific feature and, and hear what the difference is with and without Accubase, with and without time correction, with and without equalization. So it makes for a really great A to B comparison, if nothing else, just so that you can hear what a difference this makes in your own system. Even if it's not for demoing to anybody else, even if it's just for you, it's still cool to be able to hear the difference kind of before and after. So a yeah. uh, pretty neat piece. One of the things that I just wanted to also reiterate, yeah. um, both the DQDX and the DQ61, you know, these are, early DSPs that had analog controls and so they are limited by the analog controls um, that they do have. One of the reasons that DSP today has become so, um, you know, so much more popular is that we have learned as installers and as an industry to do more active systems. So that being said, you know, I think every system has a price point. If you have a customer who has passive components, they already have an aftermarket head unit, and like Matthew said, hey, they wanted to bring their system to life. Like we've all done it where we install a system, you know, it has a good amplifier and then you fire it up and then you kind of just go, meh, eh, <laughs> eh. right? Yeah. If you ever have that kind of situation, the DQDX is like the perfect solution for, for that, you know? So it all has to do with price points. If you are doing an active setup, these probably are not the products that you would want to use and the amplifiers that you have have, you know, ridiculous crossovers and everything else on them that you can go and, and do that stuff and kind of split off RCAs or whatever. 
but I think everything is price point driven. So DQDX is like the DSP for a guy who has a $2,000, $2,500 system and is looking to take it to the next level. He's, he's Absolutely. not looking to go active, double power to his front stage, you know, anything like that. He's just looking for that wow factor. That's really going to yeah. bring, you know, some staging to life, um, you know, uh, just the right amount of equalization and a passive system to really, you know, do its work and bring it to life. And then on top of that, just the fact, like Matthew has stated, just, you know, the line driver attributes in the DQ61 and the DQDX particularly are just phenomenal. I mean, yeah. you know, there's so much more, um, you know, voltage output on the DQDX that really, I'm just to be honest, there's probably maybe even a little too much. Like if you're <laughs> hot handed on, on your output levels, you know, don't be, I'll just yep. say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You do need to learn how to set these up for sure. I mean, if you, um, like Chris said, if you're hot handed with the volume on there, you're definitely going to want to make sure that you set up the output levels on these pieces, um, you know, properly for your specific amplifier and that sort of thing. Because I remember that, you know, in my own car at the DQDX is those output levels, if they're cranked, I mean, you can, you can overdrive a system depending on what that amplifier can accept and all that good stuff. And to kind of elaborate a little bit on Chris's point, he's absolutely right. Are these, the DQDX and DQ61, are these the you know, ultimate be all end all DSP? Absolutely not. Okay. But if you have that guy, like you said, with a couple thousand dollar system and he's looking to sprinkle some magic in there and make it sound better, you know, a, a six, seven, eight hundred dollar DSP plus the labor and the tuning time is not for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Not everybody's going to be willing to, to spend that amount. Not every guy needs that. I mean, if he's, if his car is maybe a little bit older or his system wasn't that elaborate or he just, you know, he wants it to sound great, but he's just like, you know, that's, that's just more than I want to do. It's just not for me. Okay, great. You know, a DQDX or a DQ61 with install, I would say at most shops, you're probably going to do it for, you know, four to 500 bucks somewhere in there. So it's a great upgrade um, that most people can probably afford and add to that system and really make it come to life, like Chris said. So with that being said, let's get into the uh, full-blown DSPs or our full-featured DSPs. Starting with the DM608, uh, which is on your screen right now, you'll notice down in the corner, I do have on there that this does use software. So the DM products, digital matrixing is what that stands for. These are going to use our DM Smart DSP software. And uh, we'll have a little bit of time here in a few minutes to dig into that software a little bit. And I'm going to show you guys some of that. Um, but the DM Smart DSP software can be used on uh, Mac or PC, Android or iPhone, iPad or Android tablets. So the compatibility is really, really broad. We've made it so that it works with just about everything. And the cool thing is the software looks the same, whether it's ran on a Mac, PC, smartphone, tablet, desktop, laptop, whatever, it doesn't matter. The software always looks the same. It just scales for size. So like I mentioned early on in this uh, training, you know, could you use a cell phone to set up a DM608 from the get-go? Yeah, you could. I don't know that I would recommend it. Um, for me and my big fat fingers, I think it'd be kind of hard to do on an iPhone. Even though the screen's fairly large these days, it, it would just be tricky. I would probably want a stylus or something if I was going to try to do it on a phone and I was in a pinch. Um, a tablet, not so bad. You've got some screen space. You've got some real estate there. But personally, I really prefer to do it on a laptop or a desktop just because you have a mouse or a trackpad, and it's just a lot easier to navigate, especially if it's your first time or you're setting up the product for the first time from scratch, I definitely recommend using a desktop or laptop. And part of that is because software updates for these products and firmware updates are only available via a desktop or laptop. You cannot update the firmware on one of these products through a tablet or a smartphone just a heads up. So if you are thinking about using a tablet or smartphone to set these up and, and tune them, that's great. Just know ahead of time that you may want to, when you first get this out of the box, you may want to plug it into a desktop computer in your home or something like that ahead of time and just power it up just enough to, you know, get it plugged in, run the firmware updates, and then maybe go install it in the car and tune it from your tablet or something like that if that's what you want to do. But as far as physical features on the DM608, um, the 608, just like the model number suggests, really pretty simple. It's six channels in, eight channels out. 
So when we say six channels in, we actually have six channels of high level input. We also have six channels of low level input. And then we've got a couple of extra inputs here. We have our uh, digital optical and digital coaxial input as well. So there's some cool availability there for um, some of you guys maybe that are using higher end MP3 or not even MP3, but media players, I should call them. Some of those high end media players have a coax or optical output. What a great way to integrate those in and get the best quality sound. Or like I mentioned earlier, if you have a newer vehicle that's amplified and you're using like a pack amp pro module, a lot of those have the option to do the optical add-on and you could run a single optical cable from that pack amp pro straight into a DM608 and have one cable that's carrying all of your signal and get a super, super clean signal. We also have, uh, like I mentioned, our RCA inputs, high level inputs. There's six channels of high level in here. And then we have eight channels of RCA low level output. So with these pieces too, um, like we talked about with the DQDX and the DQ61, them having a line driver ability, uh, these are gonna take that even one step further. You know, we can get seven and a half volts out of a DQDX or a DQ61. We can usually get around nine and a half uh, volts out of a DM608, uh, peaking up to in the 13 volt range at, at peak. So um, really a hot, hot signal if you need it and want it. Some other I'm gonna, cool- I'm gonna go back real quick, Matthew. And just yeah, go ahead. A couple of questions back sure. on DQ, DX, DQ61. Yeah. One thing also that I did want to mention is, you know, for the price points, like Matthew said, you know, somewhere around a typical dollar might do an add-on with one of these in the in the 400 or 450 range. If you do have that customer that comes in looking for the next upgrade, they already have a $2,500 system installed, aftermarket head unit, whatever it is. The DQ DX and the DQ61, um, we retail for $299 here in the U.S. Um, so price point wise, it, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, I mean, it's it's a solid price point for what each one does. Todd did ask what the Q is on the fixed, e, fixed EQ frequencies. And I'm going to double check on that because I know that they vary by which band um, you're working on. So um, I didn't have the exact number, but I can get that for you. I know on the sub output, um, they are fixed across there. But on the other ones, I believe that they vary um, up to 1K and they adjust to app. Okay, but uh, I'll, I'll try to get the answers to that. And then somebody asked, um, Aubrey asked about the six input, six outputs on the DQ61. Um, can you use it with only two inputs? And, and yes, you sure can. So that, that is the, one of the first products that you can sum to multiple outputs, which means you can use stereo inputs and get uh, all six outputs. Um, so those are the answers that I wanted to get back to. Sorry to interrupt you. No, you're good. Um, and just to elaborate on that a little bit, I already have the screws taken off of the DQ61, um, so I could show that a little bit. But there are internal jumpers for summing. Uh, I'm going to hold this up as best I can so that you can try to see them. But there are some little bright green jumpers right there in the middle of the product. Those are for summing. So we can um, take in just two channels and get all six channels of output if we want to. It's really a, a very, very cool piece when you're building a system like that and you need something that does more than just summing, but maybe you don't quite need a, a full VSP. So great questions though. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to the 608. So um, yeah, so with the 608, uh, the other couple of things that are on here as we're going down the panel here is we do have a remote level control input. So we can use one of our um, DAS remote controls with this. And we also have our option port and then our power ground input, et cetera, and a USB. The USB is how we're going to plug the product into your desktop, laptop, et cetera. It is a USB micro connector that ends up in a um, standard USB mail. And it's a, a nice blue USB cable that we give you that comes with it, kind of the audio control blue. Uh, and that comes with these products as well. Um, the ACR3 remote uh, that you would use with this uh, can be optioned to do a couple of different things. And we'll get into that in just a second here. But I also wanna talk about, because they are obviously pretty similar, the DM810. So the DM810 is eight channels in, oops, there goes my little stand, uh, eight channels in, 10 channels out, uh, otherwise very similar to the DM608. We have high level inputs, low level inputs, 
digital coax and optical, and then 10 channels of RCA output, low level output. Um, same thing down here on the end of the product, we have our option port, our ACR3 dash control port, and then our power um, terminal. Now, one of the cool things on all of these products that we've talked about today, every one of these, is that of course they have a remote turn on input, but they also have a remote turn on output. So since these are clearly going to be used to turn on, or I should say send signal to amplifiers, we wanted to make sure that the uh, remote section of them was also capable of turning on a couple amplifiers. So we normally say two to three amplifiers is okay to go ahead and turn on for many of these products. Anything past that, we would recommend using a relay in line and just using the remote out from this to trigger that relay. Now I would still use a relay when you're using that remote output, that way the DM processor is turning on first. Once it's on and powered up, then it sends your signals to your amplifiers to turn on, even if it's through a relay. And that way the sequencing and the timing will be correct and you shouldn't get any sort of pops, clicks, or annoying noises when your uh, turn on sequence fires up. So I have this DM810 uh, powered up as well, so we can run through the software stuff pretty quickly here in a few minutes. Um, but one of the other neat things that I wanted to talk about before we get uh, too far into some of this stuff is the accessories that are compatible with these DM products. So the ACR3 and the ACBT24 are the two pieces that go hand in hand with the DM608, the DM810. And the reason that I want to show those before we get into some of this stuff is um, the BT24 is the, our little Bluetooth device. Now this one does Bluetooth streaming and Bluetooth app connectivity. And what we mean by that is you can use this Bluetooth adapter to set up, tune, and control these DM devices, and you can use it to stream Bluetooth audio straight into them. Now let me be clear, the Bluetooth chip only works with the DM608 and 810 as far as what we're talking about today. The DQ61 and the DQDX do not have an option port, so those will not work with the BT24, okay? So all you've gotta do is plug the BT24 straight into your DM processor like so. The DM processor will supply this with power, and that's when we'll get, uh, this one's powered up, so I'll plug it in here. That's when you start to get your flashing lights on your BT24. Not sure how well those show up on video, but you get the idea. So when those lights start blinking, that's when you can start to pair to the BT24 for streaming audio, and you can stream music straight into your DSP and then out to your system, uh, kind of bypassing that factory radio, bypassing that aftermarket radio, whatever the case may be. Um, or you can pair to it within our DM Smart DSP app, and you can do uh, system setup and tuning and all that sort of thing through there. Your ACR3 dash remote control, also a metal housed uh, dash remote, really nicely made product. I mean, a lot of dash remotes out there are kind of chintzy and flimsy and plastic. These are really, really well made, you guys. They're metal housings. They feel nice when you turn them. They've just got a really nice build quality like all of the audio control stuff does. But we even took it a step further and tried to make these with the installer in mind. These have two Phillips screws on the bottom you can pull out. This whole assembly can be disassembled and the uh, um, main stock of the knob is threaded. And so we made sure that the threads go far enough as well to where it flush mounts in a console or on a dash panel really, really nicely. And the LED can be flush mounted as well. So pretty cool stuff. We tried to think through more of that and, and make it a little bit more installer friendly. And so it's one of those things I just wanted to mention before we get uh, too far into things. I wanted to mention a couple of hardware things too. Yeah. If you go back to that, uh, the ACR picture and the BT. Yeah. Um, please note that all of the option port products, the option port was a, 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 um, a port that we kind of knew what we wanted to do with it long term. We didn't know how we wanted to do it. We knew that, you know, usually a 10 pin plug would do the trick and we were trying to figure all that stuff. So the option port was put onto the DM810 you know, three and a half years ago when we started shipping the DM810s and we really didn't have anything to plug into it, but we knew at some point we would. We initially started to think, okay, well, we need two Bluetooth pieces, one for programming and one for streaming and blah, blah, blah. Well, we ended up finding this dual Bluetooth chipset with the ACBT24 and we had the 10 pin plug. All of that to say, if you guys go to plug it in and you look at your ACBT24, are looking any product that has the option port 
there is going to be a center pin that is stuck in there on purpose. All yeah. right. So and on the BT24, that pin is missing. Yep. And we use those pins and we populate them. We basically stick them into the option ports. And the reason for that is so that you don't plug something into it upside down. All right. So we don't get it as much because a lot of guys that use audio control products day in and day out and use the ACBT24 know, hey, that pin is broken off. Yeah. A lot of times people will plug it in and unplug <laughs> oh no, this pin broke off and now it's yeah. stuck inside of my product. That's yeah. not the case. We set it up like that so that you don't plug stuff in upside down. So that's, that's a really good point. A, good point. That a lot of people don't, <laughs> don't realize. Um, if you call us, uh, we will not make you feel silly or anything like that. Uh, you'll be scratching your head going, uh, why would they do that? Well, it's just because the option port became before the options that were being plugged into it. And so that was just our way to make sure when you get one of these options to plug into the option port, you don't do it upside down. Yeah. The thing on hardware too is I don't think Matthew, you have one of the DSPs that have the covers um, taken off. I don't. The covers are on both of them. Um, there is some secret sauce in those that is yes. not in the owner's manual. So make sure you touch on that as well. Please. Of course. Yep. So um, yeah, actually let's talk about that a little bit before we get into the software here. So, um, what Chris is referring to is inside your DM608 and your DM810, uh, on these products, there are four little black Phillips screws on top. If you remove those four screws, this metal cover pops right off. And inside of here, we've got a couple of things. Um, but one of those is our uh, output voltages for each of the output channels. So you can actually tell it uh, whether you want to basically limit it to five volts or whether you want it to be able to go up to 10. Um, so you've got some, you've got some flexibility there. Um, I believe they come defaulted at five volts, if I'm not mistaken. And it's just because most amplifiers out there on the market are, are going to be, you know, safe to run with that type of output voltage. If you do take this cover off and put this up to 10 volts, make sure that you're using an amplifier that can handle that type of input voltage because there are a lot of amplifiers out there that can't. So just be aware of that. Um, but if you do have a high performance amplifier that's capable of that, by all means, you can raise up uh, those output voltages and get the most out of these products. So something kind of something kind of cool there. The, the really cool thing, guys, is that you, you probably don't even realize it, but with the DM um, standalone processors, you really have more room to have full control over the signal strength going through that thing than anything, anything, any DSP, anything on the market, because mm -hmm. give you, you know, both input and output. So you have an input level and an output uh, gain, so to speak. Then you also have that voltage multiplier um, that's built into the hardware. So that becomes extremely important when you're doing, you know, a factory like a GM Bose um, for like two years. I, you know, I want to think like 2000 and, you know, 16, 17, 17, 18, kind of that platform. Man, those things were noisy. Like they just had a lot of ground noise in them from the Bose amplifier. So with this DSP, you could actually go in, high level input, um, move those jumpers up, and then attenuate your input uh, in the app and really get rid of any kind of floor noise from the OE system. So um, way more room to have more control over that signal than anything else on the market as far as I know. Um, so, Yeah, and so uh, with control and all of those things. Uh, we're not going to have a lot of time to go over software today because we are approaching an hour. But basically, I just want to show you guys real quick um, the DM Smart DSP software and app. You know, the, the software and app is super easy to learn. It's really easy to use. Um, setup and tuning. I mean, everything about it's pretty simple. And I've said this before, but you know, if we can teach people how to use this software over the phone and we can help them set up a car that we aren't there to listen to or hear, it's got to be pretty simple. Now, is there still going to be a learning curve? Of course there is. There's always a learning curve, right? I mean, even when you get your new cell phone every year or two, you still got to kind of figure it out a little bit, right? It's the same thing. No matter how easy we make it, there is always going to be you know, a little bit of time spent trying to figure it out. 
And so if it's your first time ever dealing with one of our um, DSPs that uses software, I recommend, you know, hey, if you're gonna install it on Tuesday morning, maybe Monday night, you fire up the DSP, plug it in for the first time, you know, make sure you're getting firmware updates out of the way or anything like that that needs to be done. And that way you just kind of familiarize yourself with the software, make sure that you have at least a basic understanding of what it looks like. So with that, I have a uh, DM810 fired up here and we're gonna plug into that real quick. And let's do this. Let me get this opened up and we'll have a look with a little bit of time that we do have left. So let me just share my screen here. Aubrey had a question on the mobile tools app. It offers RTA, Polarity Tester, but it also has something about the DQ61. Any advice on how to use this? And you know what, that's, a, that's a, actually a good question. And Aubrey, myself, I have to apologize that uh, you know, most of my focus and time has been with the DM software and all that stuff. Um, so I, I have not played with that much myself. The mobile tools app um, is is pretty slick in that it gives you you know pink noise and a basic RTA. the The mobile tools app can be used with your phone's microphone, which obviously isn't going to be you know real um, accurate. Uh, or preferably, it's going to be used with one of our SA series uh, iOS microphones. So we have the SA forty one hundred and the SA forty one forty ISPL. Um, and that one will read a little bit higher on the SPL side of things, as well as a few other cool advanced features. Um, but those microphones plug straight into the lightning port on the bottom of your uh, Apple device, and then it gives you an RTA on your device. Now, it's not as detailed or as perfect as, say, the DMRTA testing tool that we offer, but it is a great solution for somebody that maybe isn't doing this professionally or doesn't quite have the money to invest in a full-blown DMRTA setup, and maybe they just want to get something for you know, more hobbyist use or, um, you know, just something that costs a little bit less. The SA series microphones work really, really well with that mobile tools app. And then that app gives you a few tools in there to help you kind of set up um, your DQ61. And basically that's the pink noise and that sort of thing that's in there. Sometimes people read the instructions and it seems a little bit misleading um, that, you know, the app is going to basically somehow interact with the DQ61 and, and help to set it up. And that's really not what it is. It's really just an audio tools app that can be helpful in setting up your DQ61. So that's the best way I can kind of explain it without really getting into it today. So on your screen right now, we have the DM Smart DSP software pulled up. I have plugged into my DM810. My DM810 um, is plugged in via USB. And basically you can see on your screen, it's just gonna ask for the password. The password, as you can see, is one, two, three, four. I'm gonna enter that in there and hit okay. And it's going to connect to the DSP. Now up in the top right hand corner of the um, software, you'll see where it shows DM810. It knows what product we're connected to, okay? You don't have to click and drop down that menu and tell it which product or anything like that. And up in the far right hand corner where it says audio control with our logo, there's a little green dot. And that little green dot is actually telling you that you are connected to a product. If that little green dot does not look lit up, then you know that you are not actually connected via USB. So I'm just gonna kind of show you a really brief overview of what the software looks like, just to give you a, a, you know, a bird's eye view of kind of what we have going on. If you wanna know more about the DM Smart DSP software in depth and you want a full walkthrough, I did a full walkthrough about two weeks ago, I believe. So you can check out our, our Facebook page and scroll back a couple of weeks in the um, Facebook Live videos and we covered DM Smart DSP for a full hour. So if you want a really, really in-depth view, we have that as well. Just check out that video from a couple weeks ago. Um, so when we're looking at the software itself here, what we can see is we've got three tabs. We have our input view, our output view, and our dashboard view that you'll see up at the top there. And one of the things that makes the DM processors unique and really pretty cool is that they have an input RTA. The input RTA is a brilliant idea and it's a great, great feature within our DSPs. Now the thing to understand is that the input RTA is an electrical RTA. So it's actually measuring the input signals coming into these products. It is not a microphone. It is not measuring acoustic response. It's measuring electrical response, okay? If you wanted to do tuning, 
and, and do acoustic response, that's where you're gonna need one of our microphone-based RTA products, like those SA microphones or our DMRTA, like I mentioned earlier. Those would be for when you're all done with the system and you wanna do some tuning. So one of the things that we'll look at though is right now down at the bottom of the screen here, I can see what my signal looks like coming into my system. So as I click on these different inputs, you can actually see the signal that's coming in. So right now I have signal on inputs one, two, I have signal on three dash four, but I don't have any signal on inputs five, six, or seven and eight. Now, one thing that I should mention, um, and this is a, again covered in the, the class we did a couple of weeks ago, is that input seven and eight is shared between the physical inputs here and the Bluetooth uh, AC BT24. So if you are using our BT24 with your DM608 or DM810, just know that the audio from this is going to come in on inputs 7-8. Also, the digital inputs are shared with 7 and 8. So the digital optical and digital coax inputs all share that input 7 and 8. Uh, and that's they're, they're set up in like a hierarchy, basically. When you look at your output view, we can see all of my outputs up at the top. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then outputs nine and outputs 10 are separate mono outputs. So you can set these up to be anything you want. As we look through the software here, we'll see the EQ down at the bottom. I have all of my summing, my crossover controls, time correction, how I want my ACR3 to behave, AccuBase is built in down here as well. And I'm just gonna really quickly go through this stuff and give you guys a brief idea of kind of how this works. So if we're on the input view and we're looking at inputs 1-2, I can see that I have some signal coming in on 1-2. That signal is full range. I've got information all the way across the audio spectrum, which is great. If for some reason I didn't see anything on my screen, I would wanna make sure, if your screen looked like this, I would wanna make sure that my RTA settings up here at the top, my sensitivity, are set to something where I can see that information on there. So you'll see as I lower the sensitivity here, um, or increase the sensitivity, I should say, uh, you'll see the audio info show up on the screen. So if you're not seeing any signal there, it means one of two things. You've either got your RTA turned up too high, you're looking at 80 or 90 dB there, or the signal coming in is just really that low, or there's no signal present at all. So if you're not sure which inputs you used or you can't remember which channels or what, you can look at these inputs and have a look there. Your input gain is right here. This is gonna show me and let me adjust how much of that input signal I want. It comes defaulted at zero dB. It goes up to plus 12 dB or down to negative 20. So I'm gonna leave that at zero right now since we're just kind of breezing through this. There's one other thing in here I do wanna mention though and that is the input delay. The input delay is something that 99.9% .9 of systems are never going to use. Chris and I have covered that in the past many, many times. Um, this is set up in milliseconds. This is not the signal delay that we recommend using for most systems. This is gonna be an advanced feature and we can talk about that another time. I'm gonna kind of skip over that to keep things brief today. But if we go to our output view, this is the stuff I really wanna cover since we are running out of time. But what I really wanna show you guys is on the outputs here. So up here at the top, it says outputs 1-2, 3-4, 5-6, so on and so forth. So if I want outputs 1-2 to be fed from inputs 1-2, I wanna make sure that 1-2 is lit up, okay? Now, if I, on outputs 3-4, also want 1-2 to send signal to those outputs, this is where I would wanna make sure that that's highlighted. If I want to sum the inputs from 1, 2, and 3, 4 together, I would wanna make sure that 3-4 is lit up as well. Now 1-2 and 3-4 are being summed together to feed outputs 3-4. On outputs 1-2, I'm only getting signal from inputs 1-2, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So when you're looking at your outputs, the easiest way to think of this, you guys, is where do I want my signal to come from? So if on outputs 5, 6, I still wanna get signal from 1-2, I would wanna make sure that that's the only one lit up. If I was gonna use that Bluetooth audio chip, and maybe that's my primary source, maybe I don't have any other source or whatever the case may be, we can put that seven and eight lit up or we could set up a different preset over here and do preset number one is audio from the factory sound system. Preset number two is audio from the Bluetooth chip. 
and you can save those presets. And we'll get into that in just a minute here. The other thing that I wanna show you is the crossover section down here. The crossover section is really simple. Uh, 12 or 24 dB per octave slope. Just make your selection by clicking on it and it kind of highlights it. And then here where it says the actual frequency, you can do one of two things. You can either drag the sliders or, so there I've basically got a, a bandpass filter, okay? Or I can click in this area and type in what I'm looking for and hit enter. So say I want it to be 40 to 14K, all right? All you've got to do is type it in and hit enter and you can get to some very exact numbers. The time delay is right down below this. This time delay is for the specific channels that are highlighted. So if I enter in some uh, numbers here or drag these sliders, I am delaying just outputs 5-6, okay? So the delay is for each set of channels, meaning you can measure and delay each speaker or set of speakers independently, which is nice. These uh, measurements or unit of measurement can be changed. So it comes defaulted to inches. If we click in tools, we can go to change output delay unit and change it to centimeters or milliseconds if that's easier for you. Over here, it says ACR3 remote. If I highlight this, I am now telling the DSP that I want the dash remote control to control the volume of this channel, okay? So let's say I'm gonna use 5-6 to drive a subwoofer amplifier. Okay, great. Maybe I want my ACR3 to be a sub-level controller. I would just wanna make sure that it is only highlighted on outputs 5-6. If I highlight it on all of my outputs, now it's a master volume control. So you can set it up either way. You also have your output configuration uh, for mono or out of phase 180 degrees, and you can also link the channels. So if 1-2 and 3-4 are all gonna be used for the same thing, maybe it's gonna drive uh, an array of speakers in some front doors or something like that, you can simply hit link and it will automatically overwrite the settings and make them the same so that you don't have to try to duplicate your own settings. Your AccuBase is right down here, threshold and level. Think of it like this, threshold is when AccuBase kicks in, level is how much, okay? So that's the easiest way to think of AccuBase, and it is nice to have a visual representation for it like this rather than dials. A lot of people find that the sliders are a little bit easier. When you're down here in your EQ, we either have a 10 band, a 14 band, or a 30 band EQ. As I click those different options, you'll see the amount of bands change. And there's a couple of cool options here too. We can either EQ channels one and two at the same time, or I can separate them. So if I click just the number one, now I'm EQing just channel one separate from channel two. If I wanna do them at the same time, I hit one dash two, hit yes, and now I'm gonna EQ those channels at the same time. Oh, Matthew, you lost the audio there, so I don't know uh, if you came unplugged or what, but uh, that just happened. There we go. Um, I'm back. So. <laughs> there we go, sorry, my microphone came unplugged. Yeah. So when we're on 30 band EQ, one of the other cool things that's built into this, you guys, is an auto EQ function. So. Let's bring this up a little bit. So this is what the signal that's coming into this system looks like. Yes, it's full range, but obviously it's nowhere near flat. So I'm gonna hit auto. You do have to click yes and say that yes, you know, the RTA is not clipping. Yes, it has sufficient level. Yes, it's in 30 band mode, etc. When I click yes, it's going to make some adjustments for me. And we'll wait for it to do its thing. There it goes. Well, it's, I, it's so funny, like when I get on um, these calls and, and you're at the office, because I keep on trying to grab and take control over the DSP, just from, <laughs> <laughs> just, just from how many tech calls I team view of in, course. do something with, you know? It's so like, you can see it's quite a bit flatter almost. now. We can run <laughs> auto several times. If I click auto again, we'll see that it's going to make some small incremental changes again here in just a moment. And we'll hit yes to accept those changes as well. And you can see that now, just after running auto two times, our, our output is now pretty darn flat, right? Now you can see that we still are missing a lot down in the lower octaves. That's because we have a crossover set. If I take the crossover down to nothing, we'll have... Oh, Sorry, I did that the wrong way. 
There we go. So now I have basically no crossover. Now we'll have more full range sound. So what's shown down here does reflect your crossover settings. That's something to keep in mind. I get a fair bit of calls from guys too that go, well, I know I have full range, but I'm only seeing, you know, blah, blah, blah on the uh, output RTA in the output view. That's because it does reflect your crossover settings. So if I go up here and I make these tweeter channels and say I cross them over at 3.6K, this is what my output looks like, okay? So it's a pretty cool system to be able to do that. You can also do RTA memories. We won't get into a whole lot of this because we're just running out of time, but we do have a house curve that kind of ghosts into the background there. You can see a little bit, and that just gives you something to shoot for. You also have the availability to um, store six of your own RTA memories and recall six of your own RTA memories, which is pretty slick. If we go to the dashboard view, you guys, I know I'm breezing through this, but we're running out of time. So I want to at least give you a brief overview. If we look at the dashboard view, the dashboard view is one of my favorites because I can see so much of what's going on all at once. So when you're in the dashboard view, it will allow you to click any output and any input channel while in the dashboard view. So right now, what I'm looking at is I'm looking at output 1-2 and input 1-2. So I can see on my input RTA, here's what I have coming in. Here's what I have going out, and here's the settings that are affecting that, okay? So if I bring this gain up a little bit, again, you can see in real time on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the effect that that has on the system. If I change the crossover point in real time, again, you'll see the effect that that has on the system, okay? So it gives you a pretty good idea of what we have going on. If I wanna make changes to the EQ, I can click down here and tap to expand. <clears throat> and I can click on any one of these little dots in here and I can use the arrows on my keyboard if I would like to rather than clicking on them individually and dragging them. So if I wanted to, I can do that. I click out of it and it takes me right back to the main dashboard view so I can see those changes that I made. When you want to save a preset up here where it says memory one, two, three, and four, we just want to make sure that we are clicking the physical number one, not where it says memory one, that's so that you can rename it. But if you click and hold on the number one, it's going to pop up and ask me, are you sure you wish to overwrite? If I say yes, I've now just saved these settings as preset number one. Now I mentioned earlier that I could also uh, make it so that maybe preset number one was audio from the factory radio, but preset number two was audio from a Bluetooth chip. We can definitely do that. So if I look at my output channels 1-2, I'm only getting signal from that factory radio, which was input 1-2, right? If I want these to actually have signal from 7-8 instead, I could do that and save it as preset number 2. And now when I jump from preset number 1 to preset number 2, what it's going to do is change the input source. So preset number 2, as you can see, is the Bluetooth, which is 7 and 8. Preset number one is inputs one, two, which were my factory radio. So obviously you'd want to do that for all of the channels that you are using, all of your active channels that you're going to be uh, processing and using through the system. So that gives you at least a bird's eye view, uh, a brief overview of the software. Like I mentioned before, if you want a, a really in-depth walkthrough, we did that a couple weeks ago uh, on this Thursday afternoon or Thursday morning training, and you can see that on Facebook Live. Just scroll down a couple of weeks and find that one. And that pretty much takes us through the uh, DM Smart DSP software. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to add before we wrap things up? Nope, nope, there's a lot there. Um, I think, you know, as we go on and, and have some more time to go through some, some more stuff, um, we can kind of get nit, nitty, nitty gritty on more and more stuff as we go through. But um, I think today, um, you know, I would just want to add in that um, pretty much all the features, the standalone processors, um, are the same as the D4800, D61200. Um, again, man, just thank you guys so much for the support in the D amplifiers. My goodness, let's talk about um, a product that is getting more and more out there in the field. And, um, you know, we're making them just as absolutely fast as we can.